feel like there's something else happening today. Is there something else happening? Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Aren't mothers awesome? Yeah. Yes. All right. Like we, we just want to take a day just to celebrate uh, something that God created. Something that God said, here is an aspect of myself. God said, let us create man and woman in our image. There's just an aspect that mothers bring to the table. Everything that is good, everything that is right, everything that is wonderful in our mothers is an expression of God. And so we just celebrate and honor that in our mothers who are in the room. Uh, those of you who are mothers, and those of us who have mothers, which is all of us. We just celebrate, and we love you, and we honor you, uh, and we're thankful to be able to celebrate today. Um, I just want to pray as we get ready to, to go into our sermon for today and what the Lord has. Uh, let's just take a moment to, to seek him in prayer. Father, again, I thank you so much for the opportunity to celebrate how you created motherhood, how you are the perfection of all the good things that motherhood brings to the table, Father. I thank you that you are a comforter. God, on a day when, when there can be hurt, there can be pain, Father, I thank you and I ask that you, Holy Spirit, would work in abundance in bringing comfort to those who mourn on a day like today. I pray for hope for any mothers who are desiring more for their children than what they're currently seeing. I look at the testimony that Carl brought this morning, saying, we will stand on your promises. We thank you for your character. We thank you that we know the desire of your heart. We sing songs like the Father's arms are open wide at the altar, Father. We know that if any of our children run back to you. You are receiving them with open arms, Father, and not a rejecting fist. We thank you for that loving, gentle compassion that you place within mothers. God, we honor the memories that we have, and we thank you for filling in the cracks of pain. We love you. We praise you. And God, as we get ready to talk about something amazing today, would you weave this story together in our hearts? Would you make it make sense? Father, I ask, would you fill my mouth with only the words that you want to be spoken? Would you fill each of our hearts and our ears with what we need to understand? I thank you that you can work despite me, but Father, I pray, asking and begging that we would work in partnership together. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you guys turn to Ephesians chapter 5 uh, in your Bibles and stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. If you have been with us for a while, you know that we are walking through uh, the last of our core values. We have being biblically grounded and spiritually empowered. We have being a church that prays desperately, a church that intentionally makes disciples. We are a church that cultivates authentic family. Uh, we are a church that... Uh, what's the last one? Intentionally makes disciples. Yeah, that's the one that we end with, the six. Okay, well, let me start from the beginning. We are a church... And start scene. Okay, we're a church. <laughs> Just kidding. No, we keep that stuff in there because you need to know we're real. What did you say? Praise desperately. Thank you. Did I not say that before? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> that is right, though. Praise desperately. You know what? I'm proud of you, Gabby. You have come such a long way. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Honor that. And today, we are continuing the, the core value of loves radically. Um, we have been in it for a while, and guess what? We're going to be in it for a while. There's just so many levels of this. There's, there is a loves radically that we need to understand here before we ever love radically here, right? The idea is that it's happening at the same time. That's like one of those, like, 
the love's right. We are, we are loving him radically because of how radically we are loved, and it's causing us to love others radically. And so we're walking through that today, and in Ephesians 5, you're going to see um, a particular way that the Lord wants us to understand radical love. So I'm going to read the first couple of verses, and then I'm going to jump down. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now let's jump down to verse 22. Not that any of the rest of the stuff isn't amazing, but I just want to jump down to verse 22 specifically for today. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Father, thank you so much. To this, the most simple yet accurate thing that we can say is yes and amen. Help us to do this well. Help us to understand this well. Help us to live in this and from this well. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I have a hard task today, right? Because I'm talking about a seemingly specific area of marriage between husband and a wife under the umbrella of loves radically. And some of you may automatically be saying, I'm not in that moment, whether it's a I've not been married yet or whether it's through some sort of loss, you are no longer married. And we recognize those those difficult moments. Some of you are in marriage right now, but where we're all caught up, and this is really good news, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have surrendered to him, I have great news. There's a wedding day coming for you. You are in your betrothal period. Do you remember the engagement? If you've been married, like the engagement period of just this exciting anticipation, that's what we're living in right now. I want to walk us through a number of things to help us to understand it because it's important for us to understand whether or not you are currently married right now. It's important for us to understand the relationship between a husband and a wife because it points to something even greater. Marriage is a shadow of something greater. Jesus said he had followers who came and just like struggled with the things he said, but they're wanting to know more about heaven. He's like, listen, if you can't understand the earthly things that I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to explain to you heavenly things in earthly terms. And if you can't understand that, how in the heavens are you going to understand heavenly things? So it's really important for us to understand this earthly example of marriage and betrothal. Because you are betrothed. Every single one of us, if we belong to Christ, is betrothed. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to disappoint you. I'm not trying to give you spiritual FOMO. But you're missing out on all the good things that I'm about to talk about. And it's not available 
outside of a relationship with Jesus through faith in what he has done for you and surrendering your life to him as Lord and Savior. Okay? I'm gonna, we're going to walk through this example of what it looks like. We're going to help understand how God created marriage and why he created marriage. We're going to see ourselves within the context of being the betrothed bride of Christ, understanding how we are radically loved and how, because of that, we should radically love God back and how we should act accordingly within marriages for those of us who are married, married or will be married one day and how to extend radical love in that context. So again, I reiterate, marriage was created by God. Does everybody understand that? Like sometimes maybe we take that for granted and don't really think about it. Maybe it's just something like God made humans and then we were like, oh, I kind of like, I kind of like that person. <laughs> like we didn't create marriage, God created marriage. It says in Genesis 3, we can say Genesis 2 is the creation of, of Adam and Eve, right? In Genesis 3, Three, we're already seeing where they are terming each other husband and wife. God is even terming them husband and wife. God created marriage from the very beginning. He didn't just create man and woman. He created a man and a woman and united them in marriage to be husband and wife. And it's important. Because God does everything for a reason. He has a purpose. It is foreshadowing. It is explaining heavenly things in our experience here on this earth. God is a God of passion, of romance, of beauty, and delight. For some of us, maybe that's like, oh, I don't really know about that. Like, God is love, but like, the love that we enjoy in love stories, like, that's just kind of like outside. That's like our thing. No, <laughs> God created those things. And the best of those things is nothing compared to what he has, compared to who he is. The things that we strive for, that we long for from the moment we're a child. I was at a, a wedding this weekend, and um, I had my, my, uh, uh, my wife and my daughters, uh, Zoe and Jillian, were with me. And I said the two of my favorite moments of the whole wedding— Number one was the bride's face. Every time, like, uh, the, the um, officiant would say um, husband or wife, the bride would go, like, just super giddy, just super excited about that. I loved that, like, just how excited she was. I'm a, I'm a wife. Like, I'm, I'm becoming a wife in this moment. My second favorite thing, looking down the row at my two daughters, even though I am not a fan of thinking about them being married one day. <laughs> Don't like that at all. <laughs> the magic in their eyes. And Lindsay caught me looking at it, looking at them, and she's like, they're thinking about their wedding one day. All the feeling, all the, think, all the thoughts, all those things that we love and seek after, God created those. And he didn't just create that for us, for us to experience with each other. He created it because that's who he is. He created it from who he is and placed it within us. All of us share, from the moment we were created, two aspects that are just hardwired into us that come straight from God. The desire to love and the, de the desire to be loved. Those are God's desires. He desires to express love to you. And he desires to be loved by you. And everything around you, everything that you look at and wonder at is pointing towards his love, towards you. Marriage represents, this is an example that he gave to, to, to represent the relationship between him and his people that are expressing romance, passion, beauty, delight. The intimacy men and women share is sourced in the intimacy God created us to enjoy with him. Yes, there's risk involved in loving others. But look at God's example. Think of how many people God created with the desire 
for them to love him back. But they either worship someone else, some, I shouldn't say someone because it's something, it's a nothing. It's a deception. They love that instead of him. They worship that instead of him. Or they say, he doesn't even exist. But God created them still with a desire that they would love him back even though they never would. Think about Jesus. Think about the fact that Jesus washed Judas Iscariot's feet the same night he knew he would betray him and send him to his death. There is risk in love. But if God himself says, I find it worth it, the pain and the suffering and the hardship that can come from the risk of love is worth it to me. I want to encourage you. It's worth the risk. Because within it, there is an experience that the Lord has that is not just you in a person, but you in him as well. I want us to take a look real quick, real quick, real quick at a glimpse of God's heart in Genesis 2 that's almost secretly depicted in the creation. Okay, so let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to see something very interesting here that can be pretty easy for us to pass over. But if we go to Genesis chapter 2, let's start in verse 5. And I think it'll be behind me as well. Where it's it, it, re-expressing um, the creation account of man. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 5 says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and, mist, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And, he, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there, were, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now let's jump down to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be all alone, should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Sound familiar? I want you to see something real quick right here. God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I'm going to make him a helper fit for him. Right? That's, that's back in, no, before that. Um, yep, 18, you're right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And then what happens next? Before Eve came, what literally is verse 19 talking about? God brings all the creatures of the earth to Adam to name. Wait a second. God says it's not good for Adam, for the man, to be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. 
okay? I don't know if you've thought through, so there's kind of this moment, okay, there is a helper coming, right? I don't know if you've ever thought through how long it would take to name all the animals of the earth, but can you imagine there's a helper coming fit for you? Now, before that, I want you to name all these animals. Like, I, I, I want to be clear only where scripture is clear, right? I can't tell you exactly what that moment was like. I can't tell you exactly how or when, if this was a conversation that the Lord was having with himself, or if he specifically told Adam, hey, buddy, like, let's name all these animals first, and then I'm going to, um, then I'm going to make you a help or whatever. If that was the case, I, just, just being honest, I probably would have been like, thing one, thing two, thing three, like, how many of these do we got here? Like, let's just go, through, like, but that wasn't the thing. Adam really shared an awesome experience with God as he is, as God is sharing the reign and rule of dominion over the earth together with Adam. But still, he says, it's not good that he be alone. Why do you think that God says, it's not good for Adam to be alone? I'm going to make him a helper, but then has him name all of the animals to realize none of these is fit enough, all the creatures, until finally he brings about. I want to suggest that perhaps this points towards Christ, who has a betrothed bride who has not yet stepped into it. There is an anticipation and a longing that Jesus has for you his bride, and that day when we will be joined together with him. Now, some of you maybe need to be reminded or just told for the first time, Revelation chapter 19 and 21 talk about a marriage of the lamb, of Christ, and his bride, the church. This is, we read in Ephesians 5, where he's talking about the husbands and wife. This is a mystery, and it's profound, but it's speaking toward Christ and his bride, the church. There is a marriage that's coming one day. And it's important for us to see that. And I think that this example, this, this, this small example, if you will, is a depiction of that anticipation. Because God's promises are true, like Carl said. They are true. It's not good that Adam, the man, be alone. I will make a helper for him makes that promise, and he does fulfill it, even if it's not immediately. And for a lot of us Americans, we don't like that. <laughs> nope. If God were to say, I just, I mean, just, just go back to teenager, like, I have a perfect spouse for you. You're, you are immediately looking around everywhere. Is it them? Is it them? Is it them? Is it them? I'm ready now. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't care that I'm 13. I'm ready. <laughs> Mom, Dad, you don't understand. You don't get it. I'm ready. Yeah, we're laughing because we probably have the same thoughts and, and conversations. But God uses the process even of waiting and anticipation. And I think that's a good depiction for us to understand that Jesus is excitedly anticipating his union with his church. We're going to walk through that because for some of us, that's kind of hard to understand, to wrap our minds around. Marriage is an image-bearing relationship, just like Ephesians 5 and Genesis 2 shows us. This concept of, of God relating to his people with, with the imagery of husband and wife, God has used throughout Scripture. In, in so many different ways, through people like Moses, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Ezekiel, Jesus. This example of husband and wife. Isaiah 54, 5 uh, says, the maker is your husband. Hosea 2, 16. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband. A few verses later, Hosea 2.19, I will betroth you to me. What's fascinating about that verbiage 
and I'm going to walk through in just a second, is the understanding of betrothal. Because you have to, in order to understand what God is saying, you need to understand who God is saying it to and what the context and the culture in which that is said. And we'll dive in just a second into the concept of Hebrew betrothal. And just one of those things that should blow our minds, that idea, I will betroth you, that is not a concept that was, that was given to anyone who has already previously been married that is given to a chaste virgin, virgin. And what I want you to understand is that's how God sees you. We see the unrighteousness of ourselves. We see the sin. But he came to wash us, to cleanse us, so that he might present us what? In Ephesians 5 that we started with? Clean, spotless, pure, white, washed. He sees you as a chaste virgin, spiritually, unto him. It's not because of anything you did, but because of everything he did. That is the miracle of the blood of Christ that we sing about. Scripture says, without the washing, without the pouring of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So he came and lived the life we were supposed to live but didn't, and died the death we were supposed to die, but now don't have to because he did in our place. When he raised again, it was so that we will raise again. And what's waiting for us on the other side of that? A marriage. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> a uniting together with him. I just want to share a couple of things about the Hebrew and Jewish betrothal um, and how we understand this when God says, you are betrothed to me. The bride and groom, so the man and the woman, there's, there's actually like the whole concept of, of marriage had two components, the betrothal and the actual wedding ceremony. And the families would come together at the betrothal and they would betroth their son and their daughter together. And in this moment of betrothal, they were legally husband and wife, legally married. For us, that's... That's, that's different. For us, we're like, okay, we're engaged. We're like super serious. We were like serious before, but now we're like super serious and stuff. But there's still like a chance. They're like, they're still like may, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I, I don't know. Like, no, they, they were legally bound together as husband and wife. That's important. And you need to understand the only way that that was broken was literally through a letter or certificate of divorce. Could you even unbreak that betrothal? It's not how we understand engagement today. So this helps us make sense when we get to the Christmas story of Mary, who is betrothed to Joseph, and he's like, I'm just going to secretly divorce her. I'm like, hold on a second. Wait, what? That's why that's in there. Because as a betrothed couple, they were already legally husband and wife, but they were not allowed to enjoy all of the things you get to enjoy as husband and wife. They could not consummate the marriage. They, they weren't left alone. They often had... Uh, um, like family that would spend time with them when they spent time together. There's still a period of time. Um, the betrothal was signified by something of value, traditionally a ring. And it was the groom who gave a ring to the bride. So we still see that today in our culture. We see an example of it. Um, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee and the seal of the full salvation and union with God that we will one day receive. Do we have Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, KJ? Let me pull that up. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What's your salvific Engagement ring, the Holy Spirit within you. This is why I ask people all the time when they're struggling to understand, am I truly saved? I point back not just to, did you say some words before? I point to, if you truly made a moment of surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior, he put a wedding ring on your finger. Yeah. He put an engagement ring on your finger. 
and his name is the Holy Spirit. Is there any moment where you can look back and see the activity of the Holy Spirit? Undeniably him and not you at work in your life. That's what I often point to when I'm helping people discern, am I saved? And that wedding ring, some of y'all ladies know what it's like. As soon as you get that, you're all of a sudden walking around like this. <laughs> How you doing? Oh, hi. Right? Like, I used to, like, Lindsay, can you run up here real quick? Just run up here real quick, please. Yes. I know you hate the stage, but, yeah. Come on up here. There was a moment in time where we were just dating, right? And we would hold hands like this, right? We would hold hands. We would walk around. We're dating. Yeah. We're a thing, right? But as soon as that rain came around, all of a sudden, we were walking around like this, right? Like, we're just, I don't know. Hold on. Maybe it was like this, right? Like, we're walking around the mall like, take a look at us. I'm sorry, is that in your eye? I can't quite tell. Oh, it's a, we're getting married. Yeah, that's right. How did you know? <laughs> right? Thank you, babe. <laughs> she hates being in the center of attention. Yeah. Can I just suggest that perhaps we should walk around like, I've got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I belong to him. He belongs to me. He loves me so much he put himself within me. You have an engagement ring, wear it proud. Let him wear you proud. <coughs> the betrothal family, or the, in the betrothal, the bride's family lost a member while the groom's family gained a member. And usually the newlyweds would live in a portion of the groom's father's house. See the spiritual connotation there? We are grafted into the family of God, the Father. And we go from here to dwell in eternity in his house. That's what's coming. Some of the significant parts of the betrothal period and the concept of the Hebrew betrothal and how it points to what God is trying to get us to see. Here's another thing about marriage, right? It is an image-bearing institution that God created for us to understand him, experience him and understand him. We see even from what Paul says in Ephesians that the husband has the unique opportunity to represent Jesus to his wife. What Paul is saying, husbands love your wives the way that Jesus loves his church. This is a unique opportunity, a huge obligation, a huge just, I mean, it's, it's, it's good and it's heavy. Now, here's something else that I believe that I actually haven't heard talked about a whole lot, but I think that the wives have a unique opportunity to mirror image Holy Spirit. And here's why. Here's why I say that. While the Holy Spirit is equal in his identity as part of the Trinity of God, he still humbles himself in submission to the Father. He takes from the Father and sends it forth. He operates by submitting himself to the Father, even though he is equal parts Trinity. He is God. You understand that? Jesus is God. Yahweh, the Father, is God. Holy Spirit is God, three in one. Do I need to remind us that's a, a doctrinal theological belief that we hold in the Christian faith? He is God. Even though he is equal in standing and who he is as God, he still submits himself to the Father. Just as Paul encourages wives to submit to their husband as their husband leads them the way that Jesus leads his church. The wife is equal in value to the husband, yet her role is to submit to the leadership of her husband. 
Just as the Holy Spirit empowers us, the wife supplies empowerment to her husband through encouragement, words of life, supplying us husband with good ideas and protecting us from the really, really bad ones at times. Speaking words of life, man, a a, a husband who knows that his wife is behind him stands a little stronger can withstand all the nonsense that anybody else has to say when he knows he's going home to a wife who believes in him, who is for him, who loves him. That brings an empowerment that is, that is intangible. But also, I would point out the fact that uh, the wife is a more, protect, more protected part of the relationship. You guys remember when Jesus said, hey, you can, blas- you can commit blasphemy against the father, and against the Son, but we're not going to have none of this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. There was a certain protectiveness over the Holy Spirit. But when it talks about the wives being the weaker vessel, right? There's a, there's a physical and general reality to the fact that when God made most women, they have less muscle structure than the way that God made most men, right? It's a very widely debated concept right now in our society. But see, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is weaker, but he is protected, and we see that. We see that in Jesus' own words. And the wife is to be protected by her husband, is to be led by her husband. Also, God said it's not good that the man be alone. I will find someone to help him. You remember what Jesus told his believers? I'm not going to leave you alone. The Father is going to send a helper. Women, you have an amazing opportunity to mirror image Holy Spirit in your relationship as a wife unto her husband. Husbands, you have the opportunity to mirror image Jesus for his church. Powerful, heavy, but good. Now, the hardest part that I think I have about this morning is just, I could be wrong, but I think the the, the most difficult people group that I have in the room, through the video, on the podcast, whatever, to explain the concept that you are a betrothed bride unto a waiting groom in Christ as you belong to the church and that he is after an intimacy together with you that is beyond anything you've ever experienced. The most difficult people group I think I have to speak to right now is 50% of you. Men. I get it. We're like a bride waiting for a groom. Wait, I'm a bride? Hold on a second. I'm a bride. I guess, yeah. I'm like, all right, I guess. But we struggle, right? Even the word intimacy, like, like what does that mean? Like intimacy. I was talking with Lindsay. I was like, man, I, I feel the tension because as, as women, you're called to, 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 to be an example, to, to prepare. You are a bride, and you're preparing to be a bride. But men, we're like kind of told, hey, you, you, are, you need to be like the groom, Jesus, right? But you need to prepare to, to be the bride. And so we struggle. Like, man, what, how does that, what does that look like? What is, how does that, I'm not quite sure. So I want to take a second because you may not have asked the question, but you might be thinking the question. And some of you ladies might even be thinking, how does that work? Like, what does that mean that we're going to be married to Christ? And some of you men are like, yeah, seriously, honey, take notes. No, you take your own notes. (laughs) Replay it. We need to understand a few things. Number one, I will reiterate the fact and just remember this. Marriage, like many other things in this world, are worldly illustrations of a heavenly reality. God talked about sowing and reaping. He talked about plants. He used concepts that humans experiencing this world would understand to explain heavenly kingdom realities that go beyond it. 
Marriage is the same. Marriage is an earthly illustration to help us understand a heavenly reality. The marriage of the lamb and the church is not meant to be directly viewed as we understand marriage between a husband and wife here on earth. For example, the bride of Christ is a collective church. There are men and women who collectively make up the bride of Christ. And when we talk about intimacy with God, an intimacy between Christ and his bride, the church, we will have to leave behind the former things of this world, the elementary foreshadows of greater things to come. This marriage, wedding, ceremony, and feast that is coming is being explained to us in terms that we better understand to prepare for, but there's more. In heaven, intimacy between Christ and the church, I'm convinced, is way better than anything physical. Way better. It will be relational and spiritual. The marriage between Christ and the church will be relational and spiritual. The two shall become one flesh mystery is an even greater fulfillment of the promise Jesus made in John 14, 23, saying, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The marriage union that we're talking about is an even greater fulfillment of that reality, which we experience to a degree here and now. You will love me, we will love you, and we will make our home with you. The physical union and intimacy that a husband and wife share when they are married is fantastic. It's powerful. It's wonderful. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's fun. It's incredible. But it, just like all the other things of this world, are just a foretaste of something greater. Whether you can believe that or not. Remove what our culture typically associates um, with the term intimacy in the physical sense. Usually when we talk about intimacy, this is where a lot of us men get hung up when we're talking about intimacy with God. We're like, I I don't know what that looks like. I'm not quite sure. But intimacy, we have to remove it from what our culture typically relates that as a physical concept when we're talking about intimacy and especially within the, con- uh, the context of relationship, uh, we have to remove the physical sense of intimacy. Intimacy means by definition, it means close familiarity or friendship, closeness. That's intimacy. That's what it means by definition. It is knowing someone really well and being really well known by that person. When we talk about having an intimate moment with someone, right, what we're talking about in the non-physical sense of the word is we're referring to two people having a moment between them that was significant and it was shared and maybe even vulnerable. It's a moment where you kind of learn something new about each other or you experience something new with the other person. It was a moment where you learned something and, and, and that moment kind of bonds you together in a, in, a, in a new way. Like, oh, that was kind of an intimate moment. Right? It, was, it was shared between the two of them. This is the type of intimacy that is available to us with God right now. This is why quiet, alone time with God is so important. Fighting to create that intimate moment where the two of us are coming together. We bear our heart and soul to him, and he reveals himself to us. That's what he's after. He wants us to know his thoughts, his hearts, his feelings. He wants us to experience those things. That's the intimacy. He wants deep intimacy to know and to be known. Again, we have to go back to the fact that Jesus warns about a day when people will come to him saying, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me. They'll say, whoa, 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 I I did all these things for you and in your name. And what does he say? I never knew you. We didn't have intimacy. You know about me. But you don't know me, and I don't know you. We didn't have that intimate relationship that he was after the whole time. And guys, I'm convinced that we in particular really need the fight to understand that. 
Because when we don't understand it, we tend to lean towards, I'm going to do. I'm going to earn. And it kind of makes sense how easily the Pharisees slipped into works-based righteousness. I'm getting my validation because I'm doing the things. When God's saying, I'm after your heart. And again, I remind you, he wants you to know him in this. It's not just a, all right, make yourself known. Come tell me all your thoughts. And, and he wants that. He wants you to express in relationship what you're thinking and feeling, even though he already knows it. But he also wants you to know his heart. He wants to share things together with you. That's the intimacy he's after, and that's available for you right here and now. Here's a wonderful truth. We have access to more than we can handle. When it comes to a relationship and intimacy with God, you have access to more than you can handle. How do I know that? Well, first of all, there's verses like, um, you have received, we have the mind of Christ. <sighs> Literally. We're the mind of Christ. How do, I, how do I comprehend that? It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. You have access to more than you can handle. How do I know that? Because Paul reminds us in Ephesians that you have been strengthened by power in the Holy Spirit. Just a reminder, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power, that same helper gives you strength to begin to understand and experience the height, breadth, depth of God's love. You have access to more than you can handle, and you will need supernatural help to understand it and to handle it. You have access to that. We've got to understand the invitation that exists in all of this. But marriage is a process. Mark Wavis isn't even married. <laughs> he knows that. When we say yes to Jesus, we are instantly united into one spirit with him. It's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's eternal and complete possession. When I talk about this union, the, the, the whole, the two shall become one flesh mystery, I think is, is just beyond multiplied in heaven. One day, the whole concept of we as his bride, we the, the church as his bride, we're using that example because of not just the ceremony, not just that moment, but because of what happens after that, when the two shall become one flesh. I'm convinced that in heaven, this union, the two becoming one flesh, is a relational and spiritual union within you, the completeness. We have a taste and it's good right now. Have you ever been on cloud nine, like with, with the Lord? You're just spiritually on a, on a spiritual high. Like he is amazing. You love him. You have seen him do amazing things. You know how powerfully you are loved. It's like that only better and constantly. That's what heaven is like. That's the union. It, it is the fullness of the Father and the Son and the Spirit in you. We will be united spiritually that everywhere you go, can I, just, can I just tell you a wonderful thing? You will never wonder if the Lord sees you or loves you ever again. There will never be a moment where you feel alone. There will never be a moment where you experience sadness or grief or pain. How is that possible? It's only possible if you exist in a vacuum without sin, without pain, without hurt, without those things, and that vacuum is the spiritual union that you will have together with him one day when the two will become one. Think about that. Let that blow your mind. Let that excite you. Let that create within you the feeling of like a bride waiting for her groom will be a church ready for you. 
don't have time to go in, into the concepts of Galilean weddings where Jesus was from and the idea of the fact that even the groom didn't know when the exact moment was. The father would tell the groom, it's time. A lot of times it'd be in the middle of the night. Go get, go get your buddies, go get some torches, and go get your wife. And bring her into my house. Jesus said, his return will be like a thief in the night. But will he find his workers working? And I suggest he's not interested in you just working for the sake of doing what you're supposed to do. He's interested in you being so wrapped up head over heels in love with him. You're just, you're just working from that place. That's what he wants. And that's the awesome opportunity that we have in marriage and in relationships in general to reflect this truth of mirror imaging what is coming for us. We become one when we pledge in covenant to another, to a spouse, and we continue the process of becoming one for the rest of our lives, right? We become one. Lindsay and I talk about that all the time. Like, we loved each other, like, a lot, almost 17 years ago on that wedding day. But it pales in comparison to how much we love each other now. We were united in one, but we are so much more united and unified now. That's just 16, 17 years. Can you imagine an eternity, forever, complete unity with the Lord? When two people who are brought up under different upbringings, have different passions, personality types, and are different people with different thoughts and habits, no matter how much those two people have in common, they have equally as much in conflict with each other. No matter how much they're alike, each couple has a myriad of differences. Therefore, the journey into oneness is difficult and takes time. And to complicate matters, each of you is broken. Instead of two people bringing their own half to come together and make a whole, <laughs> both of you is bringing a whole and colliding together. <laughs> and the selfishness and the self-centeredness is supposed to be the part that breaks off in order to you then both make one whole. <laughs> That's the purpose. The journey into oneness does violence to our self-centeredness and hopefully produces selflessness in our souls. This selflessness is radical love. Because worldly love will say things like, I love you, but what it really means is I love the way you make me feel. I love you so that I can get something. I love you for what you do for me. Radical love says, I love you, and I will die for you. And he literally did. Radical love knows the unrighteousness that we've had and the unrighteousness that we will continue to choose. But says, I will die for you so that you will stand spotless, righteous, holy in my presence. I will present you unto myself in beauty and splendor. Most people imagine love to be something that will fulfill all their wants and desires but instead it requires you to give up all your wants and desires for the blessing of another. Unfortunately, uh, many people think that marriage will be the answer to their loneliness, temptations, and needs. It's a fantasy. Rather than getting your needs met, marriage exposes your neediness in God. Wherever there are fissures in the foundation of your soul, marriage is sure to offer the necessary uh, um, pressures to expose all of your internal fault lines. 
Ultimately, marriage is far less about getting your needs met than it is about fashioning the character of God in your souls. But it's an opportunity to see that happen. Can I just take a moment to remind you that no matter what brokenness you may be experiencing in this moment of that opportunity, look again to the baptism. You're not broken. I don't have time to walk through the Song of Songs, but in the very beginning, there's a moment where she looks, the Song of Songs is this love story. Often people talk about it. It's a love story depicting Christ and his bride, the church. This man and this woman going back and forth in, in a love poem song conversation. And she says to him, one of the first things she says to him, she says, don't look at me because I'm dark, because my skin is dark. And what she means by that is, culturally, I remember when I was in Indonesia, right, and I was, I was going down the river on a boat, one summer, and it was me, another American, and our translator, Ali, who was Indonesian, right? And I'm just laying out on top of the boat. I'm just getting tanned, right? Why? Because in America, we, we want to get tanner. In Indonesia, they're putting on whitening cream to get lighter. Why? Because it's the lower class ones who work out in the field who get tanned by the sun. So it's a, a status like, oh, uh, the lighter-skinned people are the ones who don't have to work outside and don't have as much exposure to the sun. That's the same similar culture that, that the woman in Song of Songs is talking about. Don't look at my skin because I'm dark. My, my siblings, they had disregard for me and forced me to work out in, in the vineyard. So I'm, my, my skin is dark because of that. Don't, don't look at, at, at that. It's not a racial thing that she's talking about. His response beautiful and a whole lot of imagery he uses to express that you can read for yourself on your own I wish I had the time to go through all of it but God is saying you're beautiful I don't care about your perceived brokenness I don't care about you he cares about your brokenness. Let me say that. What he's saying is, it doesn't impact the beautiful you I see when I will see you face to face. Again, let me remind you, God doesn't just see the version of you that is now. He certainly doesn't just see the version of you that has walked through brokenness. When God sees you, when he interacts with you, he has in mind the you that you haven't even stepped into yet. God who knows all things past, present, and future knows the future perfected version of you. If you were to be married and just say you're married for 50 years and you were to be able to travel back through time and visit your spouse 50 years previously or 60 years previously, right? You would have within your mind, you couldn't just see them for the maybe teenage version of themselves that they are in that point of time. You see them, but you see them with this 50 years of marriage in mind, and that's the lover that you're engaging with, even though it's a teenage version of himself. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? God knows the perfected version of you. He is excited. Jesus is anticipating in excitement the perfected version that will stand before him in absolute beauty and righteousness. It will be granted to her to wear white, which is the righteous deeds of the saints. That's the version of you that he engages with you now with consideration. And what will be helpful for us in relationships is to understand that if our significant other has surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior, they have been perfected in Christ. And what they're walking through right now, it's not them. It's not the perfected version of them. And it's not the final version so we can operate in grace and love. And that's not just in marriage. That's in relationships with everyone who belongs to Christ. Lastly, 
you know, it's, an, it's important for us, there's a danger here, even in the way that we do evangelism. We have to be careful not to just focus on the benefits of salvation, right? We have to be careful not to present a gospel that just suggests, oh, it's all, you know, if you get saved, you surrender to Jesus, Lord and Savior, it's going to be rainbows and candy corns and unicorns. Like, it's, it's going to be lollipops and all good things. Everything works out great afterwards. No. We're reminded, Paul, Paul says in, in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, talking about how um, it's, it's that many of us through tribulation and hardship, we enter the kingdom. There will be hardship. That oneness, that perfection is a process. If you belong to Christ, it's called sanctification. Remember that in your relationships. It's a process. And give grace. Give mercy. I think maybe the way Jesus would say is, give as much grace and mercy as you want him to give to you. Freely you have received, freely give. The entire story of creation is a story of the of God, the extravagant lover sparing no expense to pursue and apprehend the hearts of humanity. Look at the sunset. Look at the mountains. Look at the stars. It's as if God is standing right next to us saying, I created I created those with this moment of your eyes seeing them in mind. To see me. Though humans can be unfaithful, God never is and never will be. There are no divorce papers coming your way from the Lord. (laughs) He has done much and will see his betrothal period fulfilled. So let us live truly like a bride waiting for her groom to come get her at any given moment. Taking hold of the intimacy that exists right now. It will be absolutely mind-blowingly amazing one day, but please don't forget what you have access to right now. It's more than you can handle. But God's saying, try Die and surrender to me and allow me to give you the strength to understand it, to know it, to experience it, to enjoy it, and ultimately to display it. We have been loved radically. Let us love radically within that. Will you stand with me as I talk about our next steps? Just two simple next steps. Number one, what's one thing from Ephesians 5? I want you to go back and read Ephesians 5. What's one thing from Ephesians 5 that you can put into practice this week to step into deeper intimacy with God? That's for all of us. And especially if you're married, as we've talked about marriage, what's one thing from Ephesians 5 that as a spouse you can do this week to better live out Ephesians 5 and the wonderful illustration of the gospel that you've been allowed to step into? to pray, ask our prayer and ministry team members to come down front. Man, I feel like I keep coming back to it over and over. Man, I just keep asking, fall in love with Jesus. <laughs> See from the examples we've been reading about how he feels about you and live from that place and exemplify it in your relationships with I'm going to pray and give us a moment to respond. If you need to respond by just having a moment with the Lord at the altar, if you need to respond by having someone come alongside of you and praying for whatever it is that you need to see uh, the Lord's hand at work in your life, you can come and do that with one of our prayer and ministry team members. If you have never given your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, there's a really wonderful engagement ring down here at the end of the aisle. He is fantastic. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you for your radical love. 
God, all the ways that you have loved us, all the things that you have been doing, Father, to help us see who you are and how much you love us, God, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would strengthen us, just like Paul prayed in Ephesians, strengthen us to comprehend that, and then strengthen us to live in that and from that. 